Christ Church. We've been called to a mission. And we've been called for a purpose. And though I don't do this every Sabbath, I do believe that the first Sabbath I should take time to underscore and highlight. I'm sure we're going to turn to that mission statement that's on the back of our program. And we're going to read it together because it is necessary. In gratitude to God, shall we read it together? In gratitude to God for His love, the love of Jesus Christ, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we are committed to helping others by sharing the good news of salvation. We are committed to letting Christ live His life through us so that others will know Him and His desire to save them. May God help us never to be stumbling blocks to the sincere seekers of truth. When love for self is swallowed up in love for Christ, Jesus will be lifted up, and then humanity will behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, what a privilege to be allowed the opportunity to participate in the furthering of the great mission of the great and glorious gospel, taking this gospel to the world. Father, please may the gospel reach our hearts so that we can share it in its essence and in its meaning and in its power. Thank you for blessing us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want you to notice on the life in the Lord in our program. Last Sabbath, for the first time this year, there was a quotation from the book of the book Councils on Diets and Food. And uh, for the remainder of the year, you will note that the quotations that will come under life in the Lord will be from the book Councils on Diets and Food. This morning, there is not a lot of time for me to uh, say much about why that is. But I ask that you take note. And do not just gloss it over, but pay attention. We have been for some time examining this theme, divine provision. And we've been looking at divine provision in the context of the gift of prophecy. And this morning, I'm going to take another step towards uh, completing this message on the gift of prophecy. And I look up and know that I need to be direct about it. And so, we're going to proceed. The passage we read this morning was from the book of Sam. Sam 121, verses 4 through 7. Behold, he that... Keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. He that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. He shall preserve thy soul. One of the ways through which God works to preserve His people is through the gift of prophecy. The Bible says, by a prophet they were brought forth, speaking of the deliverance from Egypt, and by a prophet they were led. And then in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 we read, and I'm going to uh, cherry pick a few verses uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15, the latter part. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed, by reason of this great multitude, for the battle 
is not yours, but God's. Can I share to the church of the living God this morning? We've been talking about living at the close of time with the final scenes in this great drama of salvation are queued up to move on to the stage of history. Can I say to you, the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. You shall, verse 17, not need to fight in this battle, but set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Amen. Verse 20. <coughs> Uh, Jehoshaphat said to the people, Believe in the Lord your God, so shall he be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. The gift of prophecy is for the prosperity and preservation of God's church. Are you with me? Amen. And so we talked about the test of a prophet. And we, we, we examined them and I gave you six uh, biblical tests that you can apply to a prophet. And I talked about prophetic accuracy. And in prophetic accuracy I gave you the passage, Jeremiah chapter 28 and verse 9. When the word of the prophet shall have come to pass, then shall it be known that the Lord hath sent him. That I gave you... Uh, Biblical faithfulness, and I gave you the text, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 to 4. If the prophet tells you to follow after other gods, even if his word comes to pass, ignore that prophet, don't follow him, don't follow anyone who will tell you to walk contrary to the word and the will of God as is clearly revealed by the Holy Spirit. In this great book called the Bible. And then I told you the prophet must exalt Jesus. Uh, 1 John chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. Every spirit that uh, confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And that is the spirit of Antichrist. And I talked about what it means to confess that Jesus is come in the flesh. To talk about the fullness of the ministry of Jesus. And then... On the matter of keeping God's commandments. I gave you the text Isaiah 8 and verse 20. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word. It is what? Because there is no light in them. Then we talk about the physical test. Numbers chapter 24 and verse 4. The prophet seeing visions with eyes wide open. Not seeing through these eyes, if you were to pass your hand before the eyes of the prophet, while the prophet is in vision, the eyes wouldn't follow your hands because the eyes are fixed on glory. And then we talk about Daniel chapter 10 verse 8, how Daniel talks about loss of physical strength. Daniel 10 verse 7, Daniel says, there was no breath in me. Physical alterations of the human being in the process of receiving a vision. And then we talked about the spiritual fruitage. If you are connected to the vine, you must be a fruit. And Jesus said, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 20, By their fruit, what? Ye shall know them. It is straightforward. If what you say is not in the Word, it doesn't matter what you do. If what you do is not in the Word, it doesn't matter what you say. For your words and your deeds must be framed by the word of God. Amen. To the law and to the testimony. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 28. We did this text and now moving forward. And God has appointed these in the church. First what? Apostles. Apostles. Second? Prophets. Prophets. The Bible predicts that in these last days the prophetic gift will be restored because by a prophet they were preserved. This gift will be found within God's church. God has given the prophetic gift to his church and he never took it back. But there are two groups of people in the world. Only two groups. Those who are under the control of the dragon and those who are under the control of the lamb. And right here is summarized the whole of your life and mine. Because it's either in every 
every moment you're worshipping the dragon or you're worshipping the lamb. It's either you are represented by the woman in the pure white garment or you're represented as those that follow the dragon. Friend, this morning, every moment of your life is worship. There is a lie we have been taught. We have been taught that there is the secular and there is the spiritual. Let me tell you this morning, no part of your life is secular. Everything about your life is worship. How you perform on the job is worship. You're either representing Jesus or you're misrepresenting him. How you speak is worship. You're either worshiping Jesus in how you speak or you're giving homage to the devil. In every single moment of your life, there is one issue that's in play and it is worship. So, a lot of people tend to think that worship is just a corporate expression. But worship is the sum total of your life lived under the control of God's spirit or under the control of the devil. So you're either worshiping God or you're worshiping Satan. Uh, there are no in between. Mm -hmm. None of your worship is wasted. No. The devil collects all that's his and God collects all that's his. Yes. The question is, who are you worshiping? Yeah. Friend, worship is no side issue. Because all this is framed out in scripture yeah. that you and I can understand the heart of God. God created man to worship him. Amen. We are created as worshiping beings. Yes. And if we are worshiping God, the true God, we worship God, the false God. Yes. But we can't help but worship. Yes. Yeah. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, the Bible says what? And the dragon yeah. takes your sin before. What's what? In rage, the dragon was wrath with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring, with the remnant of her offspring. Who do what? Keep the commandments of God and have what? The testimony of Jesus. This verse is part of a brief history of the church from before Christ's time to the time of the end. Chapter 12 of the book of Revelation predicts that the church would be persecuted during a 1,260 year period from 538 through 1798 and that it would flourish again at the end of time. And then verse 17 identifies two characteristics of God's last day people. The Bible says that they do something. What do God's last day people do? They do what? They Keep the commandments of God. Say it. They keep the commandments of God. Don't be embarrassed about it. They keep the commandments of God and they have something. So they do something and they have something. They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus. That's God's last day church. And so if the church doesn't keep the commandments of God, it's failed. It's ID examination. Yeah. If the church does not have the testimony of Jesus, it has failed its ID examination. Yeah. Our Revelation 19.10 says what? The testimony of Jesus is what? The spirit of prophecy. So the second part of the ID, first part is they keep the commandments of God. The second part is that they have the spirit of prophecy. Amen. Jesus Christ is in charge of the church. Are you with me? Amen. He has always been in charge of the church. Amen. If you believe that Jesus is an absentee landlord, you don't understand who Jesus is. Because Jesus said, I will be with you. Always. Amen. <laughs> He's in the church. Amen. The greatest religious movement of the 19th century was the Advent Movement of 1844. Many who believed studied Daniel's 2,300 days prophecy and expected the Lord to return in 1844. The movement, the Great Advent Movement was made up of Baptists, come on up, yes. Methodists, 
Congregationalists, yeah. Catholics, and many others. Let me tell you something. Truth belongs to all of God's Amen. people. Amen. Truth is not parochial. No. Truth is not personal in the sense that it belongs to you as your personal private possession. Amen. The truth belongs to everyone. Amen. Amen. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And if the truth makes you free, then you shall be free. So wherever they were, they heard the sound of the Great Advent Movement, 1840s. And they came together. They didn't come together to make a new church. As far as they were concerned, they were just following truth. Yes. What does the Bible say? The path of the just is what? Like a shining light that shines more and more onto the perfect day. And it is still true today that God's people in the Advent movement have come from many different backgrounds. Oh, yeah. If I say Catholic, some people will put up their hands. If I say Presbyterians, some people will put up their hands. If I say Anglicans, some people will put up their hands. And the people who have been in so many different places and I'm quite sure which hand to put up. <laughs> but you don't have to be ashamed of that. Because the Bible says the path of the justice is like a shining light. But it didn't just say that. It says it shines more and more onto a perfect day. God is leading people forward, but he's leading them forward to a definite destination. Amen. And the platform is truth. Amen. The prized possession then of God's people is truth. Oh, yeah. The prized possession is not a name. No. Come on now. No. The, prize, the prized possession is not a symbol. No. The prized possession. <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, Amen. and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Amen. The prized possession is Jesus. Amen. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. You've got to know Him. Because if you don't know Him, friend, you've been living in the wastelands of misery, drinking from the bitter cisterns of disappointment, deceiving yourself and being deceived. But if you know Jesus, you will hear him say, I am the living water. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. I want you to understand this afternoon that the gift of prophecy is all about Jesus. Yes. And as preparing the church to meet Jesus. Yes. Oh, they came from many different backgrounds, many different congregational movements. They were deeply motivated to prepare their minds to do one thing. They wanted to prepare their minds and their hearts to meet Jesus. Amen. I don't know if I am warm because I should be warm. Or if I'm warm because the place is warm. All right. Unfortunately, other religious leaders resented the Advent movement. And so these Adventists... When I say Adventist, I don't mean Seventh-day Adventist. Because in 1844, there was no Seventh-day Adventist church. Come on now. These were people who had just stumbled across truth. And they said, look here, get out of my way and let me follow truth. And the church was upset because the people were promoting the second coming of Jesus. And all they wanted to talk about was the second coming of Jesus. And those who were not interested in getting ready didn't want to hear the message. So they threw them out of the church. And because they couldn't remain in their former churches, the popular churches rejected them. They banded together. Those who accepted it either voluntarily left their churches or were disfellowshipped. But they were united in their common devotion to the soon coming Christ. Yes. Friend, let me tell you something. And I don't want you to misunderstand me. What I want is not a relationship with the church. No. Amen. What I need to have is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. If I'm following Amen. Jesus, I'm in the church. Amen. Come on now. Amen. But if I have a relationship with the church and I'm not following Jesus, I'm not in the church. That's right. That's right. Yes, you see, I'm in the, I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the, B-U-I-L-D-I-N-G. Or I might be in the organizational structure. But friend, when the church puts on its anti-gravity suit, 
It's not going to be branded General Conference. It's not going to be branded North American Division. I heard somebody sing and they sound sweet, low, sweet chariot. It's coming from up there. Yes. The transportation to heaven is coming from above, not from below. Yes. And friend, I am not saying that there isn't necessity for us as a people to respect structures that God has put in place. Yes. But I am saying we must never mistake structure Never allow the structure to become more important to you than the Word of God. Amen. Because if the structure replaces God in your heart, that's an idol. Yes. And this was the great fear of the people who came out of 1844. They didn't want to make a church. Because they said as soon as you form a church, it becomes Babylon. <laughs> what I mean? People who start out with the joy of the Scripture in their hearts get proud of what they have accomplished and want to protect their turf against all other comers. And we get creedal, get lead-footed and light-headed and so proud of themselves that when Jesus leads forward in greater truth and clearer truth, they struggle to follow. And so they wanted to adopt the axiom of the pilgrim as their motive for living. Uh, where I've reached is not where I'm going. I'm bound for the land of the pure and the holy. Yeah. Right. And it means that I must never allow my attachment to my understanding of truth to be dearer to me than truth. Mm -hmm. Two different things. Mm -hmm. What I understand truth to be <clears throat> might be different from what truth is. Mm -hmm. And the moment I get a clearer insight of what God requires, I must be prepared to keep moving. Are you with me? I must be prepared to pursue Jesus all the way from earth to glory. Amen. Has God blessed the Seventh-day Adventist church with the gift of prophecy? Yes. Remember I said that two things the church must have. It must have an adherence to the law of God. Yes. But it must also have within it the gift of prophecy. Yes. So the question we must ask this morning is, has God blessed the Adventist church with the gift of prophecy? Yes. I believe so. Yes. I believe with all my heart that in December of 1844, when a deeply spiritual young woman at 17 was given her first vision that the last day church, God's remnant church that could not be born before the Advent movement, but must have come to exist right around the time of the Advent movement, that church was given the second portion of its ID. Yes. In December of 1844, a deeply spiritual young woman at 17 was given her first vision. Ellen Harmon, who would later become known as Ellen G. White, saw the Advent people, book at early writings, traveling on an elevated road to heaven with a brilliant light illuminating the pathway. And her messages greatly encouraged the small scattered group of Adventists. And she said, the light behind them shining on the pathway was the midnight cry. Yeah. Friend, the midnight cry didn't originate with the Seventh-day Adventist church. The midnight cry was the cry that was sounded by all God's children with a trueness of heart, attracted by truth, who searched in the scriptures, came to the conclusion it is time to announce the second coming of Christ. Yeah. And she says, in that vision, God showed her that even though they misunderstood the event, that there was light that was shone upon their pathway and they should keep on walking. A scattered group of Adventists were gathered together and later out of the splinter of the great disappointment of 1844 would emerge the seventh day Adventist church. From 1844 until her death in December of 1915 she received more than 2,000 prophetic visions and dreams. Can you imagine? God 
opened up the channel and sent down the message. Are you with me? Yeah. And she wrote over 50 books, lectured to thousands on three continents. With amazing accuracy and insight, she wrote on subjects like education, nutrition, the life of Christ, practical godliness, general health, medical practice, and the coming world crisis. In his book, California Romantic and Beautiful, George Wharton James wrote about Ellen White. She lived her last years in California, and her influence was especially felt in that state. And here is what George Wharton wrote. He says, this remarkable woman, though almost entirely self-educated, has written and published more books in more languages which circulate to the greater extent than any other woman in history. A woman who didn't graduate grade school. But you see, friend, let me tell you, God is the source of knowledge. Amen. He's the fountain of wisdom. Amen. And the Bible says it right, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Ellen White was prolific and influential. But did she pass the test of a true prophet? The Bible gives us six specific tests. My question, how does Ellen White measure up against these tests? It's important to test everything by the Word of God. And so, I know I won't be able to complete all the tests this morning, but I will not leave here without applying some tests. Mm -hmm. Is that good? Yeah. All right, come with me. So, test number one, mm -hmm. prophetic accuracy. Mm -hmm. Let's see how accurate Ellen White was. A century ago, mm -hmm. she warned about the dangers of too much fat and sugar in the diet. Was she right? Amen. 100 years ago, over 100 years ago. Today, what are we told? Stay away from fat. And sugar is dangerous to your health. Let's keep moving. In the book Ministry of Healing, she wrote, Tobacco is a slow, insidious, but most malignant poison. Almost 70 years before the Surgeon General's report on smoking and health, she warned that's dangerous. It's a poison. It wasn't until 1964 that science linked tobacco with cancer. Yet this divine warning was given more than 70 years in advance. I said, the spirit of prophecy is given to preserve God's people. Are you with me? Amen. Well, what about what she had to say about pregnancy and prenatal development? No, I said she never graduated grade school, so I should get information talking about these things. And you know, there's some individuals who say, well, uh, she didn't originate all the things she wrote. She borrowed it from others. And let me tell you something. To be able to separate out of the cacophony of foolishness what is true, correct, and consistent without training in any of those fields says to me very clearly, you had to have been guided by wisdom beyond your peers. Amen. Are you following me? Look at the Bible. It's full of truth. Correct? Yeah. And look how many people walk around teaching lies. So, yes, there's a lot of information that was out there. But a lot of it was very wrong. And beyond the information that was out there was the additional that was provided when she would write, I was shown. 
Ellen White discussed the important effects of prenatal influence during pregnancy, and she talked about cancer as a germ long before scientific research caught up with her. Go read Councils and Diets and Food. There's a whole chapter on how the diet of the mother affects the unborn child. Go read it. <laughs> Ellen White's statements on health and disease prevention, talking about accuracy, were decades ahead of their time. I think it's exciting to see God's revealing prophetic insights that benefit humanity. Medical science today is validating the gift of prophecy. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, while the world is validating that what God gave us a hundred, over a hundred years ago is right, mm -hmm. the people within the church are turning around and saying, I don't really think God was involved in that. Mm -hmm. Well, what did she say I have to say about the occult? More than a century ago, Ellen White predicted an explosion of interest in the occult, mm. psychic phenomena, and astrology. Today, spiritualism is leaping across denominational boundaries, emerging as the dominant religious force that will one day unite all churches. Today, we have network movies like The Walking Dead on AMC. We've got uh, games, we've got Movies based on games like Games of Throne on HBO. Seven thrones that have been battled for. Mm. Sounds like Revelation, mm. except it's demonology. Mm. Then we've got the Harry Potter book series. Mm. And Disney's Life Like Harry Potter Village. Mm. Can I tell you, it grieves me how fascinated Seventh-day Adventists are with Disney. Yeah. Fascinated. Want to go up to the fairy land and go uh, take it all in the magic kingdom. Friend, I'm not fascinated with the magic kingdom. I'm fascinated with the righteous kingdom. Amen. The purveyors of uh, necromancy are uh, people who package error in childhood garments to bamboozle the minds of our children and to steal uh, their spiritual development and to cancel their conscience and corrupt their understanding of God. We, God's people, take up our monies and we take our children to go wonder at the marvels of Satan's inspiration when we've got the thus saith the Lord. Amen. And we wonder why we are spiritually weak and the church is malaise. It is because we are gazing at Babylon. That's right. That's right. That's right. It is said yes. of Lot that he pitched his tent yeah. originally toward Sodom. Mm -hmm. But if you pitch your tent toward Sodom, your face is toward it and your body will get there. That's right. That's right. And it just so happened that when Lot left, he didn't leave all of him because Mrs. Lot became a monument mm -hmm. to the destruction of Sodom. Mm -hmm. And many in God's church will be a monument to the destruction of this world. Yes. Because we have forsaken our divine call. I know. I shall have to pause. And I wish I had time. But let me say that as far as prophetic accuracy is concerned, there are conditional prophecies, prophecies that are made to be fulfilled based on you fulfilling the conditions that bring the blessings or the curse upon you. But as far as specific prediction is concerned, you cannot find anywhere where she said, the Lord showed me and it never happened. Are you following me this morning? Yeah. Right. And so prophetic accuracy, I'm going to submit, is a test yeah. that she has met. Yeah. When I pick up this message, I'm going to pick up this message of biblical accuracy. Uh, there's much I want to I wanna share with you, brother. There's much I want to share with you. But this has been a heavy morning. Mm -hmm. By the grace of God. 
Let's make your life about worship. Yeah. Yeah. Realize that when you sit before your television, that is also about worship. Yeah. When you drive your car, it's about worship. Yeah. When you sit to eat your meal, it's about worship. Yeah. So here comes the counsel of the Apostle Paul. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, Amen. Let's go on to the glory of God. Amen. The gift of prophecy is given to be a microscope on the glory of God. Yeah, right. So we as God's people can understand how to glorify God. Amen. In our body and in our spirit, which Amen. are God's. Amen. Stand with me. Stand with me. I wish, I wish that I could go on. But I don't want to keep going. And you lose what comes after. Yeah. But brethren, whatever happens, realize the time is now. That's right. yes. The moment is urgent. Mm -hmm. And the cause deserves the full measure of your devotion. Amen. So rally then. Amen. Rally then. Amen. Stand yes. by the church. Right. Why should she languish and die? Mm -hmm. Rally then! Rally then! Stand by the truth! Amen. For soon he that shall come will come. Amen. Bless the Lord, for he shall not die. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, I thank you that it is our privilege in this late moment in earth's history to sound the battle cry. Hallelujah. I can hear the notes playing from glory. Yes. And the sound of the captain can be heard loudly coming across heaven's microphone. Charge. Help us, O oh Father, that we will be faithful and stand in our lot. And with the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God burning in us that we will go for. Yes. To cut down error. Mm. Uh, to plant the trees of truth yes. that men may eat the fruit of righteousness. Oh, oh. oh my Father. What a responsibility. But I thank you that you have never given <coughs> responsibility without power. For ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Amen. Burn sin from our lives that we may be vessels ready to receive the final outpouring. Yes. That the work to be done may be done, not just around us and in us, but may be done through us. Amen. Thank you, O oh my Father, for the privilege to hear your voice. Give us the courage to go out and to search our hearts. Take away the taste for sin and give unto us a deep and earnest desire for righteousness in Jesus' name. Amen.